Hi everyone, my name is Sorsha, I'm from the Guardian Foundation and today I'm going to be telling you about how we teach media literacy skills to young people. So we work with young people aged kind of seven but officially nine all the way up to like 25 so it's quite a broad range um, and who the Guardian Foundation are in case you haven't already heard of us I don't know why you wouldn't have um, but our purpose is to promote global press freedom and improve access to liberal journalism and we want to create a world where everybody has access to reliable information from a really diverse range of sources and that everyone can hold power to account and as Lord said just now um, Free liberal media is kind of fundamental to democracy, but we also believe that in order to actually function within democracy, journalism needs to be representative, so journalists should be from all parts of society. And this is why we're doing what we're doing. So a survey in 2018 found that only 2% of children in the UK have the necessary critical literacy skills they need to tell if news is real or fake. Um, to put that into context, for adults, it goes up to about 5%. So we're no better than the children, really. Um, so absolutely terrifying statistic, that one. Um, 52% of UK 12 to 15 year olds who use social media for news say it's really difficult to tell whether news on social media is accurate or not. And 43%, sorry Lord, I'm going to contradict you, they do say that they're not interested in news and they cite it being too boring or sounding the same or even too upsetting. So what Lord was saying about people disengaging, lots of reasons there. So we have two programmes within the Guardian Foundation aimed at improving media literacy skills for young people. Um, so today I'm going to be talking mostly about Newswise because it's the project that I actually work on. Um, Newswise is for 7 to 11 year olds and we work right across the UK. But we do also have a programme for 12 and up, so 12 to about 25, called Behind the Headlines. Um, I won't be talking about that directly today, but everything that we do in Newswise is kind of echoed in Behind the Headlines. They just do it a little bit differently because um, obviously it's a slightly the older age range. Um, so there will be some interaction in my session today. It's a very hot room and we've got the afternoon slot, so you're going to be getting involved. Um, and my first question for you today is where do you find out about the news? We've obviously heard a lot this morning about TikTok and social media, um, but it'd be great to hear if there's any other sources that you get your news from. It'd be good to hear from some of the younger people and some of the slightly older people in the room. Anyone like to volunteer? Yep, at the back. Yeah, I get from Telegram. Telegram. Great, lovely, thank you. Anybody else? Yes? Um, I actually watch the news because of the, because it ties in a little bit, but like commercial media, even though there's a new to watch the news channel. Great, so TV news, lovely, yep. Nine gay. Nine gay? Yeah. Is that, yeah, great. Is that an app? Yeah, it's also a website at the same time. It's like the BT, BT version of Reddit, basically. Lovely, thank you. Anybody else? Yes. Word of mouth, good. Yep, so talking to friends and family. Yes? Yep, great. So Twitter, social media, other sites. Anyone read a newspaper anymore? Uh, yeah? Yeah, a couple of people nodding. I occasionally read a newspaper, but I think that's because I work in the Guardian office and they give us papers for free. So <laughs> over lunchtime, a little peruse before I then just put my phone on top of the news and scroll on that. Um, so thank you so much for that. So this is where our age group are finding their news. And these are in order of popularity. So we have family at the top, so word of mouth, so family and friends. TV is actually still quite popular um, because kids just have TV on. Um, so TV is still really popular. Third is social media, but obviously it's on the rise. And then everything else is kind of there as well. And newspapers, unsurprisingly, right down at the bottom. So there's lots and lots of different places that people, young people are getting their news. But um, trusted adults is the main one. TV and then social media becoming increasingly common, as we know. OK, next bit of interaction. It's coming so quickly. Um, we do fake or real quizzes in all of our workshops with our young people. We do it in all age groups. And they're a really good way of getting children to understand that when you see something on social media, it's completely out of context. And what you're doing is you're making a gut reaction to that piece of information. And you might be judging it or you might be believing it without any further information. So you're going to have a go at this this afternoon. I'm going to show you some headlines. And if you think the story is real, I would like you to put your hand up. When we do this with nine-year-olds, we give them pictures of the poo emoji on a stick so they can hold that up. I haven't got them with me today. Didn't have space in my luggage. Um, so I'm going to show you a headline, and if you think it's real, put your hand up. So did theme parks in California ban screaming on roller coasters to prevent the spread of COVID? 
If you think that is real, could you put your hand up? If you think it's fake, keep your hand down. And I want hands. Come on, guys. We're in a classroom. Hands in the air. <laughs> Fill them up. OK, we've got maybe three people, four people. OK, a smattering of people think that one is real. Would anyone like to tell me why you think it's real? Yeah, there was loads of weird news coming out in COVID. Loads of weird rules were coming in. It was really hard to know. This one is fake. So everyone who kept their hands down or just wasn't sure, congratulations, it is fake. This is a really tricky one because this headline is actually completely taken out of context. If you were to read the full story, you would see that there were recommendations put in place in theme parks to reduce the spread of COVID, like social distancing, minimizing shouting, all that kind of stuff. But screaming was never banned. However, in Japan, they did ban screaming on roller coasters. So if you'd read the story about... If you'd read the story about Japan and then you saw this headline, you'd be very, it'd be very understandable to put two and two together and think this is real, but it is not. So you would have to click through to read the whole story and how often do we actually do that when we're on social media? Did an Italian artist sell an invisible sculpture for 12,000 pounds? Put your hand up if you think this story is real. Yeah. Do you know that sometimes that's all you need, just the will, will it to be real? <laughs> okay, we've got about, okay, more people saying real than fake. Congratulations, this one is fake. Um, it's something that you want to be real. It could very easily be fake. If you had investigated this, it would have been. Oh, it's real, yeah, it's real. Did I say it's fake? Oh, it's real, I promise you, it's real. Uh, <laughs> it was reported in The Independent, it is real. Um, did, is the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine causing monkeypox? If you think the story is real, put your hand up. If you think it is fake, keep your hand down. If it's real, put your hand up. If it's fake, keep your hand down. Is the Pfizer vaccine causing monkeypox? Okay, we have one person at the back, very bold. Everyone else, you are correct. This is hopefully obviously fake. Um, the Pfizer vaccine is not causing monkeypox. This story was shared by a site called The Expose, um, who often, you might have heard of them, they often share medical misinformation. They often go viral. They were claimed, they had this map and it showed that countries where monkeypox was prevalent was where they were using the Pfizer vaccine. They ignored loads of countries that were using the Pfizer vaccine that didn't have monkeypox and they just completely came to this fake conclusion. Um, were sharks spotted swimming in Sydney train stations after the awful flooding that they had over summer? If you think this is real, can you put your hand up? If you think it's fake, keep your hand down based on this picture. Okay, again, one person at the back, really hoping the sharks in Sydney are in the train stations. Everybody else is absolutely correct. It's completely fake. Um, photoshopped shark pictures after natural disasters are really common. So if there's ever a storm or anything and you see a picture of a shark on social media, be very, very, very wary. Um, this is completely fake. And finally, have scientists taught spinach how to send emails? <laughs> if you think this one is fake, is real, sorry, put your hand up. If you think it's fake, keep your hand down. <laughs> Giving your hand down. Well, okay. So everyone's going fake for this one. This one is real. Um, there's another one where it's a little bit of a stretch. Um, the scientists at MIT in the States, um, they kind of put sensors into spinach, into the roots, so that it can detect when there's explosive material in the soil. Then that triggers an email being sent to technicians to remove it. So well done, everyone. You actually did pretty well on that. I'm impressed. Um, so to kind of contextualize this, you all did really, really well on that, but you are all adults. There's a lot of media literacy professionals in the room, there's students in the room. Um, but this is to kind of replicate what we do all day, every day on social media. You're scrolling, you see a headline or a news story in your timeline. You probably don't ch stop to check it out. You probably don't read the whole thing. You might believe it, you might share it, you might tell your friends about it. And that is having really damaging consequences. And 52% of 12 to 15 year olds say it's really difficult to tell if news stories on social media are true or not. So this is where we come in and we give them the skills to be able to um, differentiate between what's real and what's fake. So this is what we do with Newswise in the classroom. So this is all with nine to 11 year olds. So they are really, really young. You might be wondering why we work with such a young age range. We're getting them 
just as they're starting to get their own devices, someone actually asked me this um, in the break earlier, they're getting their own devices, they're starting to use them unsupervised, so most children who have their own devices are able to take them to bed but with them. So there's no parents around, parents don't know what they're looking at, um, they're starting to get social media, they're starting to have their own accounts, even if they shouldn't be on them, they're often very, very far under the age um, limit. So we're getting them at that really important stage before any bad habits get too embedded and to give them the really important skills that they need. So Newswise is all about making it really immersive, really, really fun. We um, put everything in an authentic real world context. So everything is couched in real news. We match everything up to what real journalists do every day in the newsroom. Um, we always use real um, news stories. So always high quality, really engaging. And ultimately, we develop critical literacy skills. I'm going to talk more about that in a second. Um, so that's evaluating the trustworthiness of information whilst also examining the author intention. And um, I don't know why that's jumped like that, but they ultimately produce their own real news report about a story that's happening around them for a real audience. So they have a real purpose to what they're doing. And um, all of this equips children with the confidence that they need to navigate the news. So this is how we do it immersively. We encourage teachers to turn their classrooms into real newsrooms. So you can see lots of pictures here that we have. Um, so you've got a um, classroom with a sign on the door saying that they're a newsroom now. They've got journalist training school. So pupils actually enroll in journalist training school when they start doing Newswise. You can see a teacher there enroll as chief editor with his green visor on. We've had some teachers who have completely inexplicably worn fake mustaches when they're enrolled as chief editor. We don't know why, but it's made for great pictures because then they got them for all the kids. Um, <laughs> a board there from the classroom in, the, in England, we call them working walls quite a lot. Um, so they had all the clocks set to the different time zones. They had posters up. Um, you've got kids with microphones. They props make it really, really easy. They get press passes to get into their newsroom. Um, they had a graduation so they made like little mortarboards and caps so everything is really exciting we send them newspapers so they're immersed in the text type so they know how newspapers are written because they probably have never read one before so everything's as exciting as it can be because partly because we're working with really tiny children but also because it makes it real and it gives them a real purpose for what they are learning and this is uh, the Newswise code and the Newswise values. So um, Claire actually said something very similar earlier when she was talking about the checks that you ask journalists to make um, when they're reporting on stories from their communities. So the Newswise code is stop, question, check, decide. Um, I won't get you to do the actions. When we're with children, we do get them to come up with actions for the code. I won't make you do that today. Um, but it just encourages us to stop when we see some information, question the source, question whether it's reliable, do some checks. Checking is seeing if anyone else has reported the story. And then ultimately, you decide whether it's reliable and trustworthy. And then we also have the Newswise values. And these are what we think all news should adhere to. So this is either news that you're reading and analyzing. Um, so children use it as kind of a code to check all the news reports that they read against. But also, when you're producing your own news, everything should align to these values. I'm seeing Sean from Vice nodding at the back. Um, Vice clearly following the Newswise values. Um, one of the really, really important parts of Newswise is getting children to understand how the news is made. Because the more they understand that people are behind it and people are making it and that it's kind of actually made by humans, um, and the more they understand how it's all made, the better they can deconstruct it and kind of really get into it. So we put children in roles. So there's a lot of role play. So they have a go at being chief editor, desk editor, picture editor, sub-editor, and reporter. Um, so this is our desk editor activity, which is really, really nice to do. Um, you, can, you can do it right now in your heads if you would like to. Um, so we give them the news criteria that are used by um, editors everywhere, and a series of um, headlines to pick from, and you have to decide what kind of news organization you are, and then you pick which of these stories is going to be your lead story. This also introduces the idea of audience, because audiences are very different across different news organizations. If you're a major national organization, that's very different to your audience if you're a small local organization. So the story that you pick is going to change. Um, kids always say, well, the Mars one isn't important because that's happening all the way on Mars. That makes no difference to my life. And all the adults are kind of like, yeah, OK, but it is also like finding life on Mars. So um, quite a big deal. Um, this is an example of how we use real stories throughout the project. So everything is always real. Um, we do have a couple of fake news stories within the project. Um, they are 
real fake stories, if that makes sense. They are fake stories that were published. Um, so everything is real, basically, in a very confusing way. Um, so these are the stories that we use to introduce ideas of balance. So the fact that all news reports have to be balanced. Um, we also get them to consider bias, which is a really tricky topic for this age group to get their head around. Um, someone put on the Slido in the other room, I don't know if they're in this room, um, about how if you're getting your news from lots of different sources, how do you know if something's biased? How we do that in the classroom is we would get children to look at the same news story reported by multiple different news outlets, and we get them to compare the language, the tone. It's really good to do during an election because you can get the headlines from across all the newspapers um, and see how different they are, and then you look at the writer's language and their tone and how they've written their report to identify their bias and also what their... Um, intention might be. We also look at points of view, so who is being represented, who isn't being represented. Um, that's a really good way of identifying bias. Um, we do that with the Extinction Rebellion report there, so we kind of take out the government and, you know, passers by and we only interview um, actual protesters. So you'll also kind of see there that they're real social issues. They're not just like fluffy animal stories or all about sport or all about space or anything like that. They're about things that are really happening because they really engage children's sense of social justice. Um, something else we do is look at rumour, speculation, opinion and fact online, particularly on social media during a breaking news story. Um, so this is our activity for doing that. So we couched it in the um, context of the real story of a gorilla who escaped from his enclosure at London Zoo. And we present these statements in the form of tweets. So exactly how children might come across them or how we might come across them. And they're also given a language bank. So they're given the clues that they should be looking for. And then they look at the highlighted language there in bold to identify which is fact, which is rumor, which is speculation, and which is opinion. And for anyone playing along in their heads, <laughs> The answers are there. And then this is also a really nice activity for looking at the source, so going back to questioning the source, looking at who's going to be more reliable. So in this context, a tweet by London Zoo is going to be way more reliable than a tweet by a completely random person off the street. And finally, the most kind of effective way of getting children to understand all of this and put it all into context is to put them in role as journalists and have them produce their own real news stories. So by the end of the Newswise project, children find a story happening in their local community or in their school or something that's important to them, and they research and write their own news reports. So they carry out their own interviews, they write their reports, they edit them, they sub-edit them, there's redrafting, and then they have a final news report, which then is published in some way. So it might be a school newspaper, might be on the school website. We publish them on our website as well, so we give them that real audience as well. So some really nice topics that were picked over the last couple of years. Um, COVID school closures, obviously, were a major thing. Black Lives Matter. Um, the Euros, both men's and women's, um, they're always really popular. This year, from talking to school, school elections, so school council elections, so they can kind of go a small... Um, small scale as that, or as huge scale as something global that's happening. And these are all the great reasons why we encourage people to get children to write news reports about real stories. It's a lot of what Claire said earlier, all the great outcomes you get from telling your community's stories. And that's just a really lovely quote from a teacher. Um, so to sum up, this is how we think um, effective media literacy education should happen in the classroom. So you should start with understanding um, move on to critical analysis, um, broaden access to the news, and then ultimately participate in making the news. This formatting has gone wild. Um, and then all <laughs> of that should be delivered with interactivity, authenticity, so everything should be connected to the real world, should be creative and fun and also unique. So my proposition for the manifesto mm. is thinking about how our young people, so aged I've said 7 to 18, to kind of narrow it down a little bit, um, going to be represented and spoken for in your manifesto. How are their media literacy needs going to be covered in the manifesto?